Welcome to part 2 in this series where we're building an action-adventure RPG in Game Builder Garage. In the first episode, we did some planning, some world building, we added our Bob Companion, and our Destroy Sword. Be sure to check out that video if you haven't, everything will make a lot more sense. Our goals today are to start building out our introduction game world and adding in our launch bow. Designing Act 1 Zelda games have a strong relationship to introductions. Some people love them, some can't wait to finish and just get to the meat of the game. I think they serve an important role in settling you into the world, training you in the basic gameplay, and framing the purpose of your quest. You usually obtain your outfit, your sword, and other basic tools during the introduction. I'm planning to do something similar with our intro world. You'll obtain your destroy sword and your launch bow, and you'll gain a little information on the story and plot before setting off to the next act, which is the overworld. Maybe we'll meet a character or two along the way who can shine some light on what exactly is going on. Before we start building our first game world, we need to jump back into our player character and make a few updates and additions first. Adding in the launch bow. The bow is an iconic weapon in Zelda games, and sometimes you really have to wait a while to get your hands on it. But I wanted your sword and bow to be your essential starting tool belt in The Legend of Alice. We're gonna go with a classic straight firing bow setup like in the original Zelda games. I've made some updates to the Destroy Sword so that it's more themed along with the Destroy Anodon, which a few of you suggested in the comments. And I think it looks a lot better. So we have our bow textures here to the right, and we're going to start with the bow on your back. This is going to be very similar to how we set up the sword sheath, an object, a box attached to the player's rear that is only movable with a springy connector and a connection point of center Z positive. The size will be X1, Y1, Z.10. So that looks pretty good. You wanna make sure that the texture size is similar and it's on the Z negative texture face. That way we can put the sheath on the Z center and they can be slightly offset so they don't clip with one another. We'll do something similar for the bow in front of the player, another object, a box that's movable, but this time with a connection point of X positive, Z negative, and with a size of X.8, Y1, and Z.10. The bow actually immediately lines up pretty well with where the person would hold it, and that's good for now. Next, we'll do the arrow. You start with a launch object and connect two of these textures, one on X center and one on Y center, so that the textures create a kind of 3D effect. In the launch settings, we'll set it to invisible, orange color, zero gravity, a center center connection with a Z negative launch direction, a size of 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.9, a launch speed of 50 and a launch interval of 0.5. So you can see before we add any logic, it is working and it looks okay. Now we're gonna work on our logic. For now, the button that's gonna activate the bow is the X button. Just like the sword, we'll use a flag to handle whether the bow is drawn or not. When we press the button, it is drawn and when we don't, it is not drawn. We'll adjust this later on, we'll build on it. Just like with the sword, we want the flag to determine which textures are shown. When the bow is not drawn, we don't want the bow in front of the character, and when it is, we don't want the bow on the back of the character. Part of the way I want the bow to work is that it makes the player move extremely slowly. In effect, this lets you position your shot before you let go of the string. So we're going to add another multiplier to the player movement before it actually goes into the person. And we'll have two settings, one with a constant of 1, which will let the player move at normal speed, and one multiplied by a constant of 0.1, which will decrease their speed when they have the bow drawn. So as you can see, it makes the character move really slowly. And when we add an action to it, it makes a little bit more sense. It looks like he's drawn the bow and he's positioning himself for the shot. For actually firing the bow, we'll have a trigger from zero node on so that when you let go, it's fired. Sounds are important, so we wanna add a whoosh and something else to layer on top of it. But if you leave them connected, they'll make that sound every time you move the programming screen, which is very annoying. 
Next, we'll want a cooldown on the bow, and we'll use a counter that's at negative 30, and when the bow is not drawn, the counter will go up until zero, at which point the not nodon will tell you that you're ready to fire again. We'll hook that up with an and nodon before the button press gets to the flag, and now you can only shoot your bow every half second. Now what we don't want is for you to be able to attack with the sword and the bow at the same exact time. So we're going to pull in that not attacking with the sword output and add another and node on. We'll do the same with the sword so that you can't attack with it while the bow is drawn. So it looks pretty good. You can only use one attack at a time and all of the textures are working along with it. Now we're ready to start building the level. We'll do what's called a level blockout. This is a pretty common game development term, and it's when you use rudimentary objects and shapes to fill out the basic dimensions of a level before you start to fill out the details and add finishing touches. I drew out some of my plans for the level. We want to start the player off in a small beginning area where he travels through a narrow corridor, learning the platforming and movement before the road splits in two and you can't progress. You can either go left in through a winding dark cave, or you can go right to another section, which is going to be a deep forest. I'm going to build everything horizontally so that I can swipe across and see most of the level more clearly because things are going to get really busy on the programming screen, especially when we start to add details. I want to be able to switch to the top down view and see things more openly. I tried to avoid rotating objects as much as possible because rotations don't always show up on the programming screen how you expect them to and it might give you a headache down the road. One of the benefits of making a level block out is that you don't have to worry about the details of where everything goes and you're not tied exactly to the shapes that you set out. You're just creating the space volumes so that you can get an idea of how big you want things to be and how long you want it to take to traverse from one point to another. My goal is to keep the level block out under 200 nodons so that we have a really good amount to work with if we want to expand past where the road forks or so that we can fill every nook and cranny with little details and interactable objects. When changing environments, like going from a forest to a cave, it's important to not only change the colors, but also the way that the world is shaped and the way the player moves through it. We want to confine them into these smaller corridors that make you feel a little claustrophobic. I'll add the roof at the end so that the programming screen doesn't become an absolute mess yet. This involves a lot of switching between the programming screen and play modes so that you can move through the space and make sure that everything is going how you would like it to. Now that we have all of our basic dimensions, I'll start to mark the level with some fancy objects for later. I'm using hippos for challenges or platforming bits and apples for points of interest, treasure chests for objectives, and finally, we're adding all the teleports necessary to go in and out of the cave at the beginning and at the end. And this is why it's important to keep teleports free, because just two entrance exits occupies four channels that you only get eight of. We're doing a final little run through to make sure that it's all working, and I think we're good to go. In the next episode, hopefully we can add some details, flourishes, build out these platforming sections, and maybe add some enemies. With what we've done so far, we're only at about 186 nodon, which is great, and it gives us a lot of room to add things. A lot of you seem to be enjoying this project, and I'm really excited to keep working on it. So, I'll see you in the next one.